Hi guys, welcome back. Today I want to talk about sharpening images and this is a subject that I've probably been putting off for a little longer than I should have because it's actually quite complicated and if you do it wrong you can create some really horrendous results and it's not always easy to understand where you're going wrong. I don't know all of the scientific detail and actually after a couple of days of really hardcore research I still don't know all of this scientific detail because it's just too damn complicated. But what I will say is that traditional thinking about image sharpening has it that um, there is two stages or there are two stages. One is called input sharpening or capture sharpening and that involves um, massaging effectively the luminance values in the raw file um, to create a harder border between, if you like, bright values and dark values. So we're going to find out in this video just why the process of demosaicing raw files makes them softer and so some balancing has to be done. And then there is output sharpening, which is correcting levels of sharpening to compensate for either softening in a computer screen or softening in the process of using an inkjet printer where ink is applied to paper and necessarily blurs ever so slightly. So thinking of it in those terms um, helps us to avoid some of the wilder excesses of sharpening that we've all seen on the internet. So let's have a look at the technology. What is a raw file really? This is something about which I've seen an absolute shitload of nonsense talked on the internet. Now, a raw file is not actually an image, it's a set of data which allows a process, a computer process, to build an image up. And this relates directly to sensor technology. So if we look very briefly at what, is, what a sensor is, a sensor consists of a silicon layer, and on top of that silicon layer there is a bunch of what are called photosites, which are broadly analogous to pixels. I'm not going to go any deeper than that. Um, but these are effectively light-sensitive cells, and all they do is measure the amount of light that is coming into the, that part of the sensor. Now, on top of that layer, you've got a checkerboard layer of red, green, and blue cells and these are normally arranged again there are differences to this notably Fuji but I'm not going to go into the detail of it but these are broadly usually most often arranged in alternate rows of alternate colors so you get green and blue and then a row of green and red and you end up with twice as many green cells as you do red or blue cells and this is there to compensate for the fact that the human eye is way more sensitive to green than any other color. So what we're effectively doing is putting filters on top of our light sensitive um, cells and we're filtering into green, red and blue. And you can probably guess the rest. This, these RGB values are combined compared to the neighboring photosites to give a shade of a color and this is what generates all of the colors that we see in Adobe RGB or sRGB or uh, DxO extended palette. There are two things you can do with sharpening. One is quite straightforward. It's uh, heightening the difference between those luminance values. The other methods, and those which are mainly responsible for introducing absolutely horrific results, um, are a lot more complicated than that. And we're going to have a look at how this plays out in the um, DxO catalogue now. Okay, first off we're going to look at Pure Raw. Now, what Pure Raw is, is effectively a preprocessor and it's the most analogous to the traditional input sharpening. 
um, in terms of the way we perceive it. So if you're a Lightroom user, you will probably or possibly or <laughs> you should be using Pure Raw to do pre-processing and apply the DxO demosaicing process to your raw files. And this involves a little bit of sharpening and it's corrective sharpening. And in recent versions of the noise reduction algorithm, um, we've seen DxO introduce a choice of the level of sharpening that you want. So this is uh, corrective sharpening. It's applied to luminosity values. Now let's have a look at this in the software. Loaded and untreated raw files. So there's been no process processing at all done on this raw file. And we're going to have a quick view through the optical corrections that are applied. So first off, we'll start with high quality and we can flip that on and flip it off again. And you can see that the picture on the right hand side of the dividing line is brighter. It looks sharper, but I think that's a more a definition of um, perhaps a little contrast being applied, or it could be a, it could be simply um, to do with the corrections for the digital process. So this may be a, a prior to specific lens softness correction. However, looking at the high quality one, if we turn lens softness on and if we go to a much greater magnification and we switch this to hard, there is no real difference at all. So this as a correction is simply not relevant to high quality. Go to deep prime, we've got out of the box lens softness so it looks like there really hasn't been a much um, sharpening. If we go turn lens softness on at harsh, that looks harsh to me. But if I turn that back to soft, that looks much more realistic and I, I could actually with this one go up a level to standard and for me I'm looking at you know two to one size ratio this is um, a big magnification and I'm not sure that um, I would see that level of detail in the actual picture so I think with standards, that's probably as far as I might want to go. To me, this looks like a little bit over sharp and it's not to me that realistic. Um, if I go into Deep Prime XD2, um, again, if we go back to soft, that is better, I think, than the um, than the Deep Prime version. To me, the Deep Prime XD2 one looks a little bit more detailed, as more realistic. Um, and we can dial that all the way up to hard, at which point I think for me this looks very over-sharpened. So I think there's a message here which is that be careful with what you're doing in um, this view. So if we look at the picture in full, um, we might have hard turned on, it might look okay in that picture, but zooming in close, you start to see that um, actually it's perhaps slightly over sharp and dialing this back to standard looks to my eyes more acceptable. And yeah, that still looks realistic. It doesn't look over sharpened. So this is where we've got to with pure raw. So in the context of what we discussed earlier, um, pure raw falls into a pre-processing um, category and therefore you might expect it to be dealing only with input sharpening. 
I think what we can see from this little experiment is that there is some level of input sharpening that goes on prior and independent of the optical corrections. So in the high quality view, it is clearly sharper, even though the lens corrections are not having any effect. So it's clearly sharper. The thing to remember is applied evenly to the whole picture. Um, so far as the um, AI that informs this process um, is not interfering with that, if you see what I mean. So I suspect it's not being applied evenly to the whole picture, um, but it's being applied in a, in a manner that suits the style of picture that it is. Okay, right, let's move on. Now let's have a look at DxO Photo Lab. Um, DxO Photo Lab can apply sharpening corrections automatically as part of the preset that you apply when you import the picture. So what's happening is Photo Lab is performing the demosaicing on your picture and as part of that it can apply sharpness corrections. Now these can be switched off or they can be switched on and you can choose from a variety of different presets which layer different effects on top of the noise reduction. But the fundamental thing is that that basic, what used to be input sharpening, that basic correction for the um, demosaicing process is applied automatically on import. And this is common to most processing software. So it's common to Lightroom um, and this in a way is not a great thing because it means that um, we believe or we come to believe because this is so easy that um, actually you know we're not doing any sharpening but that's not true we're doing sharpening by default it happens automatically okay here we are open with a different copy we've got a variety of softness, stroke, sharpness adjustments um, that can be made. Now, the first one to point out is the one that comes with optical corrections. So if I apply this optical correction, I'm applying a sharpness correction. If we look in the um, detail here, you can see um, that's the nature of that correction. It's set to default to 1, details at 50, bokeh at 50. Um, and if we go 1 to 1 on this, and uh, let's split the screen so we can see before and after. On the left before, um, on the right with. So we can see here there has been um, a softness correction. Now, if we turn this up, you can see that that's at top level, and you can see that this is much, much sharper. Um, too sharp for my liking. I think this is, again, is too much. Having said which, I do think this is slightly preferable to the um, the one delivered by Pure Raw, but this, that's entirely subjective. If we push the details up, you see you've got more control over that. Let's push it up to the max in order to push it all up to the max, although bokeh is irrelevant to this particular slice of this picture. However, um, that's as sharp as you're being allowed to take it with lens softness. Okay, and I, I think that this is in the context of, of, you know, looking at this picture from a distance, this is probably borderline acceptable for me. Some people might prefer this. I would personally take this down a little bit and, and I would take the details down. So the defaults here are 50% details and we're going to, the default is actually plus one here. So I think for me, as 
viewed simply as a softness correction, this is a good correction. Do I need to add any more sharpness on? Well, that's debatable. However, the thing to point out is that I have got ample room to add sharpness here. And this kind of keeps me honest if I stick with lens software correction. It doesn't get out of hand. So moving on from this, if we go to the unsharp mask, this is where things can get out of hand. So if we raise the unsharp mask, you can see immediately this is way, way over sharpened. And if I turn that up and I turn this up, I can rather keep that down. Um, we've got edge offset, so we can really push this towards highlighting the edges. Um, it's way too much for my liking. Um, and I can't help thinking that um, I really don't need, certainly in this picture, which was shot with a, an L-class Canon lens, it's a very sharp lens. There is a lot of sharpness there. And with my lens correction and going in to look at this really closely, I, this to me is an acceptably good level of sharpness. I could take that maybe a little bit further, um, but to my eyes, this is starting to push at the edges of how much sharpness I might actually want in a picture. Now there is one more place that we can get sharp controls in Photolab. And if I want more flexibility, at this point we're applying sharpness more or less equally to the entire picture within the bounds of the AI that informs this process. Um, if I really want to grab control of this, um, I can go to my local adjustments. I can take this back to um, full size. And let's say I want to apply an adjustment just down here in the foreground. I can put my control point in there. I can drag it up there. but And um, I'm not going to waste time demonstrating this, but we can uh, play with the chroma and luma to bring the effect of that control point in. What I wanted to show you was here. There's a sharpness slider. And what I can do is increase the sharpness of that one little area. And if we take that up to 200%, motor it across here, you can see that there is a really big difference in the amount of sharpness that we can take in. So I think that this control here is a variant of the unsharp mask. Um, however, um, useful because this is one of the ways that we can introduce depth into a photograph by emphasizing not just the tone and the color, in the foreground, but by emphasizing the sharpness as well, we're mimicking real life. And so I'd be tempted just to increase that a little bit, say 31 in this case, and I've got real definition around this tiny sprig of grass. Okay, so let's now move on and have a look and see what happens in the Nick collection. First thing that I would say about this process is that we need to turn lens softness correction off um, here. And the reason for that uh, is that using Nick, we can apply that sharpness independently and we've got slightly more control over it than we have here. So let's choose the correct um, one, it's this one. Let's go to Nick Collection and we're going to 
do Nick 7 pre sharpener. So this is quite a straightforward application and this is simply, well, this is dealing with pre sharpening in the panel here and with selective sharpening in the panel here. So this does cross the boundary, if you like, between uh, pure input sharpening or, and um, creative sharpening. So let's have a look. So we've got the loop tool here and this shows us our before and after. Adaptive sharpening is set to 50%. So if we increase that you can see immediately in the loop that this is making a big, big difference. Okay. Now balance sharpening, um, let's whack that up to its highest. Balance sharpening allows you to move the emphasis of the sharpening um, away from the edges and towards larger areas. So the way that sharpening is usually implemented or, or historically has often been implemented is that um, the contrast between edges, different areas of different colors and different tonal characteristics is emphasized and in fact that's what that's doing is producing greater contrast which in turn tricks the brain into thinking it's greater sharpness. Now, with the control entitled balance sharpening, we can move the emphasis out to the edges and, I mean, I've really pushed this to its limit so it doesn't look that great. Um, but the trick is to find a balance between edge sharpening and area sharpening and what's interesting here is that um, yes you can see a difference in the loop but you can also see quite a difference in the big picture so these are not these are pretty radical controls and the art here is to find a happy medium between edge sharpening which looks completely unrealistic in the um, in the waves. C just does not look like that. And area sharpening which is much less well defined as you look further away. Um, the ripples look much rounder. Um, and the trick is to balance these two controls. So adaptive sharpening is effectively a volume control. Um, balance sharpening uh, is that. Um, there is another control which is high ISO sharpening and I'm not sure that I can really demonstrate this particularly well here. Possibly we can if we push up the edges and push this up to full blast and look down at the area around here where we've got some reflections in the water um, we might find that that's somewhat improved if we go up to about 100%. Dial it down, it, it actually kind of looks okay, but if we take, if we flip that into high ISO, normal high ISO, what we're doing is we're moving the threshold of detail. So in terms of the big picture here, the, the, what this is designed to do is to avoid sharpening noise. The, um, the, the danger in all, all of these sharpening algorithms is that if there is noise present in the picture, you're sharpening noise as well as the picture. Um, and this control high ISO is a way of getting around that. Um, so interesting if we flip back to normal high ISO, it looks to my eyes 
slightly over sharp in the normal and slightly better in the high ISO setting but this is with the edges set all the way up to a hundred so if we move if we take this down a bit um, let's flip again I'm not seeing I'm seeing a little bit of difference here at this point that's beginning to err on the side of the high ISO to my eyes okay the next thing is uh, and, and what I would sort of urge with using pre-sharpener is that you keep referring back to the whole picture. So we go back to um, this and make sure that the thing is still looking realistic. Um, with selective sharpening, we can apply selective adjustments. And what this is... Um, and let's take this to say here. We'll take this in a bit, in a lot. We'll fix that up. We're just going to try and sort of sharpen up this waterline just because we can. So let's take that in. So just that little area there. Now, what we're of course doing, if you've looked at some of the other videos, um, by doing this, we're taking the sharpening away from the whole picture and we're focusing it in the area where the control point is. So moving this is obviously affecting this area here, but it's not affecting the rest of the picture. Okay, so this is giving us a lot of creative control here. And I can do this with control lines with the poly polygonal tool, polygonal selections. Um, so I could choose simply to um, select the rock and sharpen that and leave the sea alone. And you can do it with luminosity masks as well. Okay, so again, let's um, go up to 100% on this, let's scroll it up, okay, so let's have a bit more sharpening applied here, yeah, see that immediately creates a difference, take the sharpening away, it's a little bit soft, take it up, that becomes like a real frozen second, same things apply, applying the edge sharpening or the area sharpening. And the same thing applies with normal or ISO. These are all ways that you can affect the appearance of your sharpening. So this is an interesting one because pre-sharpener was historically pretty much in the realm of um, input sharpening. Um, clearly, with the ability to do selective sharpening, selective adjustments, we've kind of moved beyond that. We're into a much more creative area. The other thing we can do with the selective sharpening, we can um, look at the mask here, and we can affect that in terms of uh, opacity, luminance, and chrominance. So we can really... Um, get this down in exactly the same way as we can with other control points right across the NIC Collection 7. Okay, so let's move this on to the next level in the NIC Collection. Let's switch it through to NIC Sharpener Output. NIC Sharpener Output is all about um, presentation layer sharpening. So this is if we're moving out to print, we want to compensate for the inevitable softening that's going to happen with with um, ink on paper. Um, we might want to just sharpen it a little bit for screen. Um, okay, so moving this on, we choose which mode we're going to look at. So display inkjet, 
continuous tone, half tone, um, hybrid device, I'm not quite sure what's meant by that, I have to say. But if we're going to display, um, let's have a look at this. So again, we can move up the adaptive sharpening. It's not massive, you're not getting any of the really unpleasant effects that you could get with the unsharp mask. But um, so that gives us just the ability to adjust our already set uh, level of sharpening. And then we can adjust the strength of that adjustment. And that's going on here. And we can zoom in on structure, big difference. And we can take it away, way over sharpened. Um, we can go in on contrast. Again, note the effect that contrast has on your perception of sharpness. And uh, we can go in on focus. And we've got the same set of controls here. We can go for selective adjustments or we can go for color ranges. So we can effectively um, choose to do the sea or the rock on their own without doing that. We could also use luminosity mask to select various areas of the rock. But let's have a quick look at how this works in practice. So with creative sharpening, personally, I think this is all about selective sharpening. Now, um, and the, I'll tell, show you the reason that I think this. If I'm applying maximum sharpening across the image, I don't want to see this area really sharp. And to be fair, it's not massively over sharpened, but it is somewhat over sharpened. Now what happens in life is that I look at the front of what I'm seeing right in front of my eyes is invariably sharper than what I'm seeing at 100 meters distance. And actually here with this picture, we're looking at something that was lit, almost literally at my feet um, against this rock, which was probably 50 feet below me and 30 or 40 feet out beyond the cliff that I was balancing on. All right, so let's blow this up and have a look and see what we're able to do with the aid of control points. And let's set a control point here. All right, and we can affect the luminance, or rather we can, we can look at the way this control point is, um, is manifesting in the mask. by adjusting the diffusion here. So if we look at there, that's as much as it's going to be applied. Oh, everything else is masked out. Um, we can move the chrominance. We can make the selection much more um, smaller. Uh, the luminance, we can really bring this in on individual areas. And then, of course, we go back to our creative sharpening and start to look at how that's going to look in the flesh. So let's take this away from that. Let's go up to um, let's go up to two hundred percent. Come back down. Right across at the edge, won't we? Here we are. Okay, so we can bring this in a little bit more. And again, let's affect that. So you can see the correction being applied. That's 100%. You can see the structure we can move away from local contrast. It makes it a little murkier. 
we can push local contrast up, really make it start to ping uh, and focus. Now, what I find interesting about this is that I think this tool is having a much more realistic and much more effective effect um, than I was able to sh achieve in Photolab on its own. So this is interesting for me because actually I'm very prone to finishing the job in, in Photolab um, and using simply the controls that I find there. But if we take this back out to um, normal view, um, we can see that that area is very much in focus. This probably isn't the ideal picture to demonstrate this. I probably do want a little bit more foreground in the picture. But you can see at a glance that this is much more um, highly focused here. And your eye is inevitably now drawn to this point. So thanks a lot for watching guys if you're still with us this far. I know this has been a long and complex um, video. Um, if there's, if there's a, I, I know from my research that this was pretty badly represented as a topic on the, on the internet. A lot of the information is five or six years old. Um, so if there's stuff in this video that you think is wrong or if you think uh, you didn't know this and it's helped you to understand the whole sharpening landscape, do add a comment down below. Um, I get back to all the comments and if you haven't already, please subscribe. It makes a big difference to the uh, YouTube algorithm. It helps get these videos out there. And uh, if not, add a like if you're already subscribed. That would be marvellous. We'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.